This week we are going to be talking about evaluating resources. And the reason why is because we don't want you to poison your research with bad sources. The majority of our discussion today will be surrounding evaluating sources based on the CRAAP test. And that stands for currency, relevance, authority, accuracy, and purpose. We'll talk about each of these in more depth as we go along. So to begin, currency. This is really about the timeliness of the information. So we'll talk about the information cycle just a little bit here and then a little bit more in depth later in the semester. But when we talk about timeliness, it's really about the publication timeline. And if you look in your text, it's covered on pages 105 and 106. So the publication timeline influences the content of the publication as well as defines the uses for it. Now, the flow of information, if you think about how we get information and at what rate we get it, um, you think, first of all, breaking news generally comes first through the web, and then the next day or so, it will come in the newspaper, maybe within the following week or month, it will come into a popular magazine. And often trade journals will also pick it up within the, a few months as well. And finally, about six months to a year later, it shows up in a scholarly journal. And then a book, perhaps this takes one to five years to write a book based on an event, something that's happened. And then finally, it will show up in reference materials such as encyclopedias. So to give you a better idea of what this looks like, take a look at this diagram and if you start at the top, we have the internet. So any breaking news, for example, think of the tsunami that hit several years ago. You saw it on the internet first and then the broadcast media picked it up. So CNN and Fox News, it was plastered everywhere on the news. The next day you get some information in the newspaper and then within the month it might show up on in Time Magazine or another popular type of magazine. And then we have trade journals and scholarly journals within the next year, generally. And by years one or between one and five, they might show up in various books and uh, reference books, like an encyclopedia to give the history, background, total number of deaths. So also if you think about this information cycle, whenever you start at the top with the internet, it's typically very vague and only a little bit of information is provided. As it moves through this cycle, more information is gathered. It gives you more in-depth information, more accurate information. And so by the time it ends up in a reference book, it should have the, the most current information as well as the most accurate information. Now some of the questions to consider when we think about currency are when was the information published or posted? So that that makes a difference. Also has it been updated or revised? Um, a lot of times you'll see on a on a web page or a news um, an online news magazine, it will say an original publication date and then a revised or updated date. So is, has it been updated since it was originally published? That information lends to its currency, as well as is the information out of date for your topic? Um, some of the things to consider, and the, and the book talks about this quite a bit, is, uh, and we'll go into this a little bit more later, but uh, you know, when, if you're doing a topic that is technology based, for example, then it will need to be very current, as in within the last year. Um, but if you're doing a history piece, then it doesn't really matter when you get the information. And then also you want to check to make sure that the links, see if the links are functional. That gives you an idea of whether or not the website is current. 
Now, the textbook chapter that we had you read this week gives you a lot of more detail information about checking resources or determining, um, evaluating resources on the, on the web, which is a great thing to do because you'll be doing a lot of that or ex it explains a lot of that information. Now, moving on to relevance. And this is really the importance of the information for what you need. So think of, think of a, a recipe, for example. Say you're wanting to make chocolate chip cookies and you have butter and sugar and flour and you also have ground beef. Now, is the ground beef really relevant to your recipe for chocolate chip cookies? Well, absolutely not. And you can think of it the same way when you're dealing with your research. Um, you know, is, is the information relevant? And so here are some questions to consider whenever you are trying to determine relevance. First of all, does it relate to your topic or answer your question? If it doesn't do either of those two things, then don't even bother looking at the source. It's not really important um, because you want something that's relevant for what you're researching. And then also, who's the intended audience? Is it designed for someone in elementary school? Or is it designed for a PhD or an MD? You know, depending on what you're writing or what you're searching for, it could be something geared for elementary school if you're in early childhood education that might be okay but if you are finding sources that are written for an MD and you're in nursing and it might be specific in the trade journals or something like that where it's written just at a level that's too high and too specific for what you need then it's also not relevant so just gauge what you're reading based on who the intended audience is. And also, is the information at an appropriate level? So going back to the example of is it written for an elementary school level or a middle school level, high school level, all of those play into why it's relevant for your particular usage. And have you already looked at a variety of other sources before choosing this, this particular one? Um, as you go through the semester, you'll, you'll find that you learn more and more about your topic. And that's, that's the beauty of research, right? You get to learn something. So as you're looking through these different sources and evaluating them, you need to determine whether or not the information that's provided to you is also being relayed in other sources. And if, it, if it's not, then it could either be a a new stream of research that you haven't yet looked at, um, or it could be something that's completely off base and not credible. So as you go through this process of evaluating your source, you'll be able to determine whether or not it's credible and whether you should include it in your research. And then finally, would you be comfortable using it in your on your research paper? So this, you know, first for college, Lots of the professors do, of course, prefer peer-reviewed journals, and we'll talk about that more later in the semester. Uh, but if it's something that, for example, you find on Wikipedia, or if you find on just the, a comic strip in a daily news, you know, those types of things may or may not, depending on what your topic is, be relevant to your research. So. Is it something that supports your research and something that you'd be comfortable including in your paper? Those are all things to consider whenever you're trying to determine relevance. So moving on to authority. An authority really is where the source of the information is coming from. And generally there's three areas for that. We'll talk about author first. So who is the author? This is a picture of Ernest Hemingway, just in case you're curious. Um, but you know, what are the, what's the expertise of the author? What are their academic backgrounds or credentials? Do, do they have work-related experience or other life experience that allows them or 
promotes them for writing within this particular topic? Do they have a licensure or a certificate that allows them to do that? Um, affiliation is another thing. You know, do they work f for a major corporation or are they a professor at Harvard or Yale or within a, a particular department that they're writing from? And then have they published in other, in other journals or do they have other books that have been published? So take a look at all of those different things and to help you determine whether or not they have the authority to write on their particular topic. Another thing that generally most authors include is a way to contact them, either the author directly or through the publisher. So these are different things to consider when you're looking at authority and the author with, with the paper or book. So the other two areas are the authority of the publisher and the authority of the sponsors. So here's a, a graphic of some of the many publishers that we have, um, that we use on a regular basis. But who is the publisher? Um, is it Penguin? Is it Oxford? Uh, Marion Webster? Kaplan? These are all really big name publishers. So when whenever you think of whether or not there is authority behind the publisher, is the publisher well known? Is the publisher reputable? Has it had any problems or had to retract books or state or articles or anything like that? Um, keep in mind those kinds of things. And different types of publishers include university presses, trade presses, uh, government agencies, of course, you know, like the Department of Education. Also, nonprofit organizations will often publish within their own organization. And then you have specialized presses. You can self-publish and pay, pay attention to those kinds of things, especially the self-publication and the vanity press, which are the vanity press is when an author pays to have the book published. Um, those types of things, you know, typically they're not reviewed, uh, so you can, the author can write whatever they want. Uh, so that might le not lend itself very well to being, um, showing authority when you're looking at that type of publication. So here are some questions to consider. As we talked about, who's the author, the publisher, and the source, or the sponsor? Um, sponsors, another area for sponsors, you know, that can be an individual or an organization. And sponsors are typically places or organizations like a foundation. So there might be an education foundation that sponsors a research project or sponsors a paper being written. Um, those are the difference between a publisher and a sponsor. And then also, you know, is the author's credentials or organization affiliation given? So do they talk about the degrees that they have? Do they talk about what university they work for? Those are all things. And what is the author's credentials? Um, as well as what qualifications do they have to write on the topic. You know, if they are, if they're a nuclear scientist, why are they writing about gardening? So if there's a disconnect in their, in their education or credentials from what they're writing about, you may or may not want to use that person as a credible source. And then also, like I mentioned, is the contact information provided. And where did you get it? Um, you know, the, the location of the URL can play into a lot of information on whether or not it's a credible source. So is it a .com, which means that it's a commercial website? Is it an EDU or an education, a government website, or a nonprofit, which is an org, .org website? Um, those tend to be more credible than just a regular .com or .net. So keep all of these questions in mind as you think about determining authority. Now moving on, we have accuracy. Accuracy is really the reliability, truthfulness, and correctness of the informational content. So is it reliable? Is it truthful? Is it correct? How can you tell those things? You know, where does the information come from? Is it a primary source? Um, the primary source, uh, which is original material or original research, you know, new knowledge that has been added to the research, 
a first-hand account. So here, some of the examples of that are diaries or interviews, original research. All of those things are primary sources. And this should be a review from what, um, what you learned last week. But a secondary source, you know, any interpretations or evaluations of those primary sources, any commentaries or discussions, um, things that, re that uh, relate back to a primary source but don't actually conduct any research of its own. So the literature review or an annotated bibliography that you're going to do, these are secondary sources because you're taking information from those primary sources a lot of times and putting it into a new document. So some examples of that are histories, uh, textbooks, and some journal articles as well. And then finally you have tertiary sources, which are collections of primary and secondary works. So all of our almanacs and encyclopedias all fall within that tertiary source of information. So is the information supported by evidence? You know, we have to look at things through this magnifying glass sometimes and really try to figure out, is it, how can I tell if it's supported by evidence? So for books and manuscripts, and actually for articles and websites as well, one thing that you can do is check for a reference list. Do they have a reference list provided? Can you go and look up sources that they cite within their book, article, or website? Uh, is the, are the web links active that, so that you can travel from one site to another to verify the information? That's a really good way to tell whether or not a source is supported by evidence. And then why is this important? Well, for individually, it helps keep you from looking foolish honestly you know you if you're citing a source and you didn't double check to make sure that it's accurate then you're passing on bad information this is also why it's bad for the discipline or why it's important for the discipline so if within your department everyone is citing one particular source that happens to be inaccurate then everything that's going out of that department it can't be trusted. So it's a way of building that trust within academia and within the realm of publishing and things like that. So it's important that you as an individual pay attention to the supported evidence so that you then are showing within your discipline that you're that you're credible and within your university or within whatever organization you're working with. So has the information been peer reviewed? Now this week we do have a video that you can watch peer review in five minutes to kind of give you an idea of what the peer review process really is. And you want to, how can you tell whether or not something's been peer reviewed? Um, typically books and manuscripts aren't peer reviewed. Um, journals and some magazine articles, depending on the type of uh, magazine that it's in, may or may not be peer-reviewed. So we have several different ways that you can check that. Whenever you're looking up a source, and we'll talk about this later in the semester as we start searching for things, but there is a way that it's indicated in the search record whether or not the items within that source are peer-reviewed. Um, that's one way to check, and then we'll talk about some other ways as well. But peer, being peer-reviewed lends itself to accuracy because other experts within the field have reviewed the information to make sure that it is consistent with the other things that the field has determined. And why is this important? It goes back again to the idea of supporting evidence. For yourself, it's important because you want to make sure that you have the most credible and accurate information that you are including in your research and then passing on. That way you don't, you don't muddy the field uh, within your discipline and you don't muddy the field within the publication, um, but it's good to make sure that you use peer-reviewed items because they do lend to higher credibility and higher accuracy. So a few more questions to consider in this area is can you look up the sources? 
Um, as I said, the links on a website, are they active? Can you go from one thing to another easily? Or did the author cite a source in such a way that you can look it up in a database later? Um, also, is the language unbiased and free from emotion? That's a, a thing to consider as we talk about purpose in just a few minutes. Um, and then finally, is the text free of any spelling and grammar errors or any typographical errors? Um, you want something that's clean and presentable and that shows a, a level of academic excellence. So finally, purpose. Now, what are the reasons the information exists? That is what, we, what I just mentioned as far as being unbiased or free of emotion. So we have some of the questions to consider within purpose are what's the purpose of the information? Do I want to inform you about something? Am I trying to teach you something, so a tutorial? Am I trying to sell you something so it's much more persuasive? Is it just for entertainment? Do you want to just, you know, look at the clothes and talk about the shoes? Or is it persuasive in the sense of something like a political piece or propaganda? So an, another thing to consider is, do the authors or sponsors make their intentions or purpose clear? A lot of, a lot of academic research will specifically state the purpose of this article is to su such and such and such. So for many peer-reviewed articles, it's easy to determine what the intent or purpose of the article is. It's generally to inform or to teach. Um, but sometimes you might not know. If it's a, well, but if it's an advertisement, for example, then they're trying to sell you something or they might be trying to entertain you. Um, but those are, that's another thing to consider. And then also is the information fact, opinion, or pro propaganda. So if you're wondering about propaganda, think of, you know, World War II ads, you know, for women to go back to work or for the movies or posters and things that, that Hitler showed the youth in Germany. Those are all types of propaganda. So, so the political view is trying to skew the opinion of uh, the general population. So if the information is fact, then you can use it. If it's opinion, sometimes you can use, depending on the type of research you can, you're doing, of course you can use any of these things, but um, you generally have to be careful about using opinion or propaganda within a research context. And next, does the point of view appear objective or impartial? These are important to consider as well because if you have a pa if you're reading a paper that's that's heavily skewed one direction or the other, then you're not getting the full story. So you need to be able to then find another source that may counterbalance that and give you whenever you're pre presenting the final information, uh, allow you to provide both sides of the story. And then finally. Are there political, ideological, cultural, religious, institutional, or personal biases uh, presented in the paper? And, and this is, like I said, it's, it, any type of source can potentially be used. It just depends on your purpose and what final result you want and whether or not you want it to be credible, authoritative, and accurate. So these are all different areas that you should consider whenever you're reviewing purpose. Now for, uh, before we, we end this presentation, the reason we've decided to uh, talk about evaluating your sources all at once is because in future assignments that you do, you will be evaluating sources based on these five items, currency, relevance, authority, accuracy, and purpose. So you will need to write a short statement about how your source meets or misses each of these evaluation points. So keep that in mind as you move forward and take a look at this as a review anytime you need it.